Hello, welcome to Faust Park, the home of the second governor of the state of Missouri, Frederick Bates. I'm here to give you a little information on the indigenous tribes who lived here thousands of years ago on the Thornhill Estates. The first group we'll talk about was about 13,500 years ago we had the Paleo Indians who frequented the area. There's actually one of the most important sites called the Martin Site which goes from Olive Street Road to the Bluffs on the river. After that, we would have the Archaic Indians, the Woodland Indians, and then the Mississippians. The Mississippian Indians are actually the ones we're gonna talk about a little bit. A long time ago, they had an archeological study done by Washington University on the site. During that, they actually found a Mississippian house. The house would measure about 16 by 22 foot, several feet deep, and on the floor, there was grass matting. The importance of this was they actually found that right after a harvest, the hut had burnt down, and during the fire, they found a bunch of corn right in the bottom of the hut. In and around the Mississippian house, they actually found five different types of tools, one of which would be for clothes making, like an awl. Another type of tool would have been for home construction, like an adze or an axe that would have been found near the hut. Another type of tool that was found around the Mississippian hut was for planting, and that would be like a hoe or a grinding stone. As the Mississippians were hunters and gatherers also, there was hunting equipment found such as arrowheads and hide scrapers. The last type of tool located around the hut that was found would have been for fabricating the hut itself with like drills and hammer stones. Hello, welcome. Can I give you some information about the history of Frederick Bates when he was at his childhood home in Virginia? He was born in Goochland County, Virginia at a plantation called Belma. His mother and father uh, were Quakers and when his father participated in the American Revolution he was uh, removed from the Quaker Society. He would grow up with a family of 11 brothers and sisters besides himself. He would have to go to work at Goochland County for the uh, county clerk. He would do that for a number of years and then he would quit and move on to another position.
1797, Frederick Bates would leave Goochland County at the, after the uh, discussion with his brother Tarleton that if he took the job in Detroit, it would be a better financial situation than going to Philadelphia because of the cost of living. On his way, he gets approached by an innkeeper asking him if he was a runaway because he looked so immature to be out so far from his home by himself. He had to produce papers that were signed by John Adams for his job as quartermaster for the army in Detroit. He serves for that. In 1800, he starts a merchant's business in the city. He also becomes a land commissioner, a judge, and would later help write the rules and regulations for the state, the territory of Michigan becoming a state. He also was involved in 1805 of the fire that was in Detroit and basically destroyed the city. He would lay out the property boundaries and give people land that would resettle and rebuild in the city of Detroit. In 1806, he heads to Washington, D.C. Uh, he becomes a Republican, and before that time, he was a Federalist. After leaving Detroit, Frederick Bates would go to Washington, and while he was in Washington, he gets two positions, Secretary of Territory and Land Commissioner of the Louisiana Territory. He arrives here April Fool's Day, April 1st, 1807, along with William Clark. His job at the time as land commissioner was to straighten out the land claims that were in dispute. He would straighten out, out of the 1,700 land claims in dispute, him and his team would straighten out over 15, 14 to 1,500 land claims. Vitally important if you're a resident of Missouri, knowing that the piece of property that you have is yours and not somebody else's. So he would deny claims, approve claims, and that's one of his major jobs and probably one of the most important things that he did while he was here in the territory. He was also Secretary of the Territory, which would write the letters and documents, and he would also be the acting governor while the governor was away. It would take Lewis quite a few months to get here before um, he would become actively becoming the governor of the state of Missouri, or the Louisiana Territory, pardon me. Um, he took a while because Jefferson had him doing things, but while he was in the East, in Virginia, Frederick Bates would be writing letters letting people know that he needed help and he needed his governors here to help make decisions because one of the things that Thomas Jefferson needed done was to remove the people connected with General Wilkerson and Aaron Burr and that needed to be done as quickly as possible because there was all sorts of illegal activities occurring at the time. One of the first things Frederick Bates did was fire a fellow by the name of John Smith T who was the judge and the sheriff of the St. Genevieve District and control of the lead mining area. He also had a way of acquiring land from people when they found lead on it that was a little below honorable. Uh, this would go on when he fired him. Uh, Mr. Smith would come and send a second to the capital, which was at that time in St. Louis, and uh, he would basically send a second to challenge Frederick Bates to a duel because he had insulted him. Frederick Bates refused the duel and managed to survive to be the second governor of the state of Missouri. So when Lewis shows up, about almost a year after his appointment, uh, Lewis takes over and Fred is doing his work as Secretary of the Territory and Land Commissioner. Him and Lewis would get in discussions and arguments and basically Frederick Bates would tell Mr. Lewis that I will deal with you when it comes to government, but I will not deal with you if I see you in public, I will walk across the street. So the animosity between Frederick Bates and Meriwether Lewis grew to fever pitch and, and uh, almost came to a duel at one time. Uh, thanks for Mr. Clark stepping in, uh, it kept the duel from becoming reality. In 1809, Meriwether Lewis would leave uh, the Louisiana Territory and head east to try to straighten out some issues with finances and other troubles and would die along the way. Uh, that would leave the governor's position vacant. Frederick Bates would step in again for a short period of time and then they replaced him with a fellow by the name of Benjamin Howard. Uh, there's a 
island out on the river or a bend in the river called Howard's Bend that exists today. He left around 1812 because he wanted to be a participant in the, uh, the uh, War of 1812. So they, in 1813 they appointed William Clark as the governor of the territory and he remained governor of the territory until 1820 during the first election. William Clark would run against a fellow by the name of Alexander McNair. William Clark would lose the election by 67% of the vote to a fellow who was the sheriff of the St. Louis district and judge of the St. Louis district, which would be the city of St. Louis technically. And uh, Clark would remain until he passes away in 1838 as general of the militia and chief of Indian affairs. So after the first election, which at that time the governor served for four years, Frederick Bates would run against a fellow by the name of William Henry Ashley. William Henry Ashley was kind of a swashbuckling type hero. He started the rendezvous system in which he would take goods to the eastern part of the Rockies and trade with the mountain men. He also was involved in land trade and mining speculation. Uh, Frederick Bates would run against him and say he was probably going to lose the election because he wasn't as flashy as William Henry Ashley was. He was a hard-working, hard-nosed government employee and did his job. And he didn't think the new people coming into the territory would vote for him, but Frederick would win the election and become the second governor of the state of Missouri. He would have a couple interesting things that appeared occurred to him on the way. One of them was General Lafayette came to town. He asked the state representatives for funding for the party, for the uh, invitation and a ball. They, were, they would not vote for it and turned it down, and so he refused to attend because the state of Missouri decided not to pay for the reception, and it was an insult and embarrassment to the governor. He would also veto a duel on, a, a bill on dueling. Um, which is an interesting fact in that his brother Tarleton was killed in Pittsburgh in 1806 in a duel. He said that to support this bill, bill on dueling, which basically said after you duel, we'll take you out and whip you in public, that that would serve no purpose. That the best thing to do is educate the children as they're young that dueling is a, a barbarous action and they should not participate in it and to start in the nurseries of our home and not wait until you're an adult to tell you that dueling is bad and punishing you by whipping you after the fact the person that you dueled against is still gone. So that's one of the things he did. He would die 10 months later and he's buried at his estate Thornhill. Nancy Opie Ball Bates was born in 1802 in Lancaster, Virginia. Following the War of 1812, her father, Colonel John Ball, brought his family to the Missouri Territory. He bought land adjacent to the Thornhill farm of Frederick Bates. Uh, Frederick and Nancy met. They married just shy of her 17th birthday. In the next five years of marriage, almost six, they had three children, Emily Caroline, Lucius Lee, and Woodville. And then Governor Frederick Bates contracted pleurisy and died here at Thornhill. Six months later, Nancy gave birth to their fourth child, a little boy whom they named Frederick in honor of his father.
When Frederick Bates died, he left Nancy as the executor to his will. That meant at the age of 23, she was in charge of collecting any money owed to him and paying any money that he owed. She was also in charge of taking care of this thousand acre farm. She had three toddlers and soon a new baby to take care of. She did have support. Her parents still lived on the land adjacent to Thornhill. Her mother-in-law lived nearby and Edward, her brother-in-law, who she remained close to until his death in 1869, lived in the city of St. Louis. There was also an enslaved family that lived here, Ben, Winnie, and their children, Hanaretta, Harriet, Margaret, Mary, Silva, and Lucy. In 1831, Nancy married Dr. Robert Ruby. They had four children, Caroline, Nancy, John, and Robert. In 1839, Dr. Ruby died, leaving Nancy a widow again. Nancy continued to live here at Thornhill after the death of Robert Ruby. She lived here with her children, except for her eldest daughter, Emily Caroline, who had married Robert Walton, and they lived on a farm close by. She lived here until the late 1850s, when her children started lives of their own, and she was basically alone here at Thornhill. At that time, she moved into the city with her daughter, Nancy, who had married Thomas Strode. Nancy lived with the Strodes until 1877 when she died of congestion of the lungs. She was brought home here to Thornhill for burial. She lies in the family cemetery next to her husband, Governor Frederick Bates. When Nancy left the property, the land went to her children with Governor Frederick Bates. Woodville had died in 1840, so that left Emily Caroline, Lucius Lee, and Frederick. What they did is they split the property into six lots, three on the bluff and three in the river valley. Emily Caroline inherited the property to the east and the land in the river valley. Frederick inherited the property to the west and the land in the river valley. And Lucius Lee inherited the house and outbuildings and the land in the River Valley. He held on to the house until March of 1884 when he sold it to the Eisenhart family. The Eisenhart family lived here until 1930 when they sold it to the Faust. The Faust never lived in this house, but their house does still stand on the opposite side of Faust Park. In 1968, Faust donated the Thornhill property to St. Louis County Parks to preserve this estate for generations to come.
we decided to visit the Bates boys that moved west. Four out of the seven would move west, the first one being Tarleton. He was an assistant clerk at Goochland County, Virginia, and then he would move to Pittsburgh. He had a government post job there. He would also be a newspaper person and write letters for the Republican newspaper, which would get him in trouble. But before that, Meriwether Lewis was stationed at Fort Fayette, and when they were there, they got to be close friends. And before Lewis took his trip to the Pacific Ocean, he would stay there when his boats were being built, and they would visit and become even closer friends while he was there. In 1806, before 1806, pardon me, Frederick Bates would be talking to his brother about possible positions, and Tarleton told Fred of two openings, one in Philadelphia and one in Detroit. He decided that he would push the one in Detroit because it was easier living and cheaper living in Detroit than it would be in Philadelphia, so he convinced Frederick Bates to go to Detroit. So without that move, without his brother Tarleton, he would have probably never left the Virginia area, and the rest of the Bates family history and the importance of the Bates family in Missouri would not have existed. So once Tarleton made that move, and then Fred made his move, to Detroit. After he left Detroit, he would go, of course, to St. Louis in 1807, and then a few years later, Edward would join him, and a few years later, James would join him. Edward would come to Missouri and go to work for a law firm. He would also get friends with his, his friend by the name of Eastus, who would name and found the city of Alton, Illinois. They would start a ferry boat company. Edward Bates was also very much involved in the development of railroads. He would go to the railroad convention in Chicago, in which he promoted St. Louis, but of course Chicago didn't want to promote St. Louis, and they didn't want a bridge built. Also, there was a ferry operation on the east side of St. Louis that did not want a, road, a bridge built. One of the things Edward Bates tried to do in the 1840s was to produce a bridge, which would save and be able to use the modern thing at that time called a railroad. Um, that did not come out. In the fire of 1848-49, uh, the steamboat named after Edward was one of the many boats that burned on the big riverfront, big fire. Edward would join, leave the Whig Party and join the Republican Party and he would go to the Chicago Convention in 1860 and become number four in the votes, which was not enough to get him elected and Edward Bates would basically help Mr. Lincoln get elected by pushing his votes over toward him, which made Lincoln the nomination for the 1860 election. Edward would then be appointed by Abraham Lincoln, Attorney General, which he would serve four years. Edward asked to be the Supreme Court judge, because the Supreme Court judge had just passed, and Lincoln basically ignored him. Edward would resign, come back to Missouri, and work on the city school system and the Missouri Historical Society. The first person to have a statue in Forest Park is of Edward Bates, which still stands today. Edward was very important in the early growth of Missouri, helped writing the state constitution. He was a member of the, the group of people that developed that. Uh, very influential in just about anything connected with St. Louis. Downtown St. Louis has a street named after him, Bates Street. Um, and he would produce 17 children, and which most of them did not make adulthood. Some would fight in the Confederacy and some would fight in the Union. Edward Bates would die. He is now currently buried at Bell Fountain Cemetery. The next one is James. James was an interesting character in that his older brothers helped support him to get his education. They would send him to Princeton. He would get in an argument, and actually a big argument, which over three quarters of the school was disciplined and sent home. And he would not go there, he would go to William Mary, but there's no real record that he ever completed his college degree. He was a bit of a wild character, according to early legends, you know, young youth. And when he came to Missouri, he started settling down a little bit, and then he went to Arkansas Territory, in which he was one of the first U.S. delegates to Washington, D.C., for the Arkansas Territory. Uh, locals would say that he was a great person, that all the tavern owners would want him to come and stay because people would come to hear him recite stories and tell 
and talk about poetry and life and it would draw people in and make the tavern owner a lot of money. Uh, enjoyed him a lot. The community liked him so much that they named a town after him, Batesville, Arkansas. He was also appointed Supreme Court Judge of the area by Thomas, by Andrew Jackson, pardon me, and he would live out his life. When he passed away, he was a major owner of a plantation in Van Buren, Arkansas. Welcome. We decided we'd talk to you a little bit about the architecture and the restoration of Governor Bates' home. We believe it was built between 1818 and 1819. Unfortunately, there are no true written records that was ever written by Frederick Bates to verify that. Uh, when he buys the property from two different people in, in the uh, early days, in 1808 and 1810, they talk about having a complete plantation. We do not understand exactly what that means but we also do not have any documentation of when the structure was actually built. So we know between 1880, 1818 and 1819, he was living here on the site and he definitely had a dwelling he needed to live in. Now, through the years, many things have happened. Uh, Wraparound porches and they removed the wing, which we call the library, from the building. Um, and then it had a wraparound porch and a two-story kitchen that was added later they reworked the old kitchen out the back which we think was an original summer kitchen that stands today from reconstruction but as you're looking at it now this is what was left of the original structure in 1968 mr faust uh, which is what faust park is named after decided that he would give us st louis county 98 acres with the intent that we restore governor bates house to what it looked like in the original time period, which we think is 1818, 1819. So the county took it on and they started on it in 1978. They completed the majority of the structure uh, after doing extensive archaeological work for two and a half years with the University, Washington University. They had three different architects, uh, architectural firms, architectural historians come out and look at it and study it. There was some major arguments about what was there and what wasn't. Uh, the archaeologists found the evidence of the library room, which is this extension right here. Found the evidence of the foundation. Uh, there was an argument about the construction of the front porch, and we'll show you a photograph of what it looked like, because we found an 1880 photograph of the front of the building with the current two-story porch on the front of it. Before that, the argument was it was a porch that went all the way across, and there was a trap door from that leading to the basement and the archaeologist was arguing that there were porch piers all the way across the front and once that photograph was found it fairly well locked down the evidence of how the porch from the front of the building would be located the kitchen when the two-story section was removed they found evidence of a smaller foundation for a summer kitchen which uh, architect by the name of gerhard kramer researched and came up with the current design that we have today so we have the kitchen, we have the wing that was reconstructed. The building is basically a English timber frame style construction, uh, hand hewn timbers. Some of it is sawn with a vertical saw, which means that the saw ran up and down was powered by a water mill. And the blade is like a cross cut saw, but it ran vertically and cut marks on a plank that you can definitely tell from modern construction techniques. The original sheeting boards and truss system is still in the building. Uh, it is hand-hewn, wooden pegged together, just like in this photograph. It has four fireplaces, no, six fireplaces in the main building and one in the summer kitchen. Um, the heating sources would be wood and it was built with fireplaces because that, that's what they would use. Interesting thing is the fireplace is open on both sides, so in the library and in the bedroom, the same flue supports the fireplaces on both sides. So. After that, we started using this for educational programs, and this is some of the things we're doing right now, is trying to educate you about the historic site and how it was constructed. We believe one of the barns is original to the time period, which dates to around 1820. The rest of the buildings on the site, we think, were constructed by his son, Lucius Lee, as he lived around the area developing the farm.
Originally, the Thornhill Estate was going to be used as a traditional museum, so there would have been cases and exhibits in here. Once the house was fully restored, the decision was made to run it more as a historic site. With a historic site, it had to be furnished, so the decision was made to use Frederick Bates's death inventory to decide how to furnish it. A death inventory is a list of possessions that the person owned at the time of their death. Now, anything that Nancy brought into the marriage was not included on this list. But we know that Frederick Bates owned 21 green Windsor chairs. We were lucky enough to receive a grant to get 21 green Windsor chairs. We know that he owned dishes and other objects that would have made a house run at the time, including bed frames, feather mattresses, quilts, including the livestock that was listed here. Now, we don't have livestock, but we do have the chairs, the dishes, and other objects that would make the house run. So, how do we know what dishes they actually had? Well, that came during the archeological dig. When they did the archeological dig, when the county got the estate, Around the house, they found a lot of one kind of dishes, and that's what we have. fortunate to have several things that actually belong to the governor. We have his books and we also happen to have his cherry drop leaf table. His death inventory states that there are two cherry drop wood tables and this is both of them combined. Um, the center portion of the table is here. When you take it apart this leaf will drop down and then the table is basically only this size, and there are two matching sides. And then you can store them up against the wall and have more room when you're not using them. We know that these were the governor's tables by a rather circuitous route. We know that he had them because they're on his death inventory. Several years ago, a family called and asked if we wanted to have these tables. The history is that in the 1880s, uh, the governor and his wife's oldest child, oldest son, Lucius Lee, sold his portion of the estate. That included the outbuildings, this portion of land, this house, and the contents. He sold this table to a family named Wallace, and it was passed down in their family for several generations. Eventually, one of the Wallace boys married a young lady whose last name was Faust. So we know where it's been and who's had it. And it was the Wallace family that gave it to us several years ago. In addition to those things which we were able to get through grant money and this fine table and the books, we also had a list of things that we tried to, they were on the death inventory, and we found them so that we can make this home a living example of the early 1800s. We know from the death inventory that he had two Dutch ovens. And so we have Dutch ovens, we have cooking equipment for our kitchen. But we do a lot of events here where we cook for a lot of people, and we need two, uh, more than two Dutch ovens, so we have seven or eight, and we have utensils, and we have more um, dishes and such. So when you come to visit, and we hope that you do, and we hope that you come during one of our events, you can see our seven or eight Dutch ovens and our utensils, and we would really like to have you here to welcome you to a home of the 1800s. Thank you.